Hello and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker, and I'm here as usual with Jeffrey Poole and Joe Lalo. And uh, we don't have a guest tonight, so we're going to talk, kind of had a request on Twitter, so I thought this would actually be a good subject since I don't think we've covered it too much in depth. We're going to kind of say what we know about the Amazon algorithms, uh, what the sales ranking is, and ideally, how to get a book to stick in the charts. That's something you'll hear about, you know, getting a book to stick. And I just want to enforce that we're not experts on any of this. It's just kind of personal, what we've seen working with our books. And, you know, I went out and tried to dig up some posts on uh, people who are do know more. You know, of course, Amazon doesn't publish any of this. They don't really want you to know how to, to work the system. And uh, most of the posts, uh, Phoenix Sullivan has a small publishing company, and uh, she used to talk about it, and they used to analyze it a lot. I know there was a group of people on Kboards.com on the Writer's Cafe, which we've mentioned before, uh, that used to really study it. And I, I don't know if they are, but I, I couldn't find that anybody was really publishing much. So this will just be what we've learned through trial and error over the years, and uh, hopefully some of it will be helpful. At the very least, I can tell you probably how to get a book to stick. I can't tell you if your book will stick. <laughs> Most of mine don't, so but uh, uh, we'll get into that later. Uh, first off, uh, we have a couple emails to read, uh, but let me see if anybody has any news they want to talk about. Have you guys had any new releases or any excitement going on? No new releases on my end, but I've passed the 60,000 word mark. I am on track to release my third book this year, which for me is a serious milestone. Uh, I've contacted my cover artist. She's agreed to take the job and uh, just waiting to, <laughs> waiting for updates because I like this part of the thing where she starts showing me what the what she's sketching out. I'm like, okay, change this, do this, do this, but haven't got my first update, so I'm just anxiously checking the email every five minutes. Uh, as for me, I do have a recent release. It's not, I, I, I'll often use the phrase, not a major release because it's not a new book, but it's a collection of every other book in my Book of Deacon se setting. It's the Book of Deacon anthology. It came out last Thursday. And I did a little test thing where I, it had a one-day exclusivity thing on Apple. I released it one day early on Apple just because Apple's treated me good and wanted to give them uh, you know, a little bit of partnership love. And that's doing okay. I didn't expect it to do great because I literally, my like, we're talking about about marketing on this. Here's the all-time best marketing ever. Um, I told my readers not to buy it because they already have all of my books, and it's not for them. It's for people who haven't read any of my stuff. So it's like for people who read the first book, which is free, the Book of Deacon, this is for the people who suddenly they want to read every other book in the series. They can now get every single book in the Book of Deacon series in one volume. So that's what that's for. Plus, it's handy to have a collection. You can we, We've spoken about it in the past, how bundled books are, are, you know, you can do better price promotion and stuff. So that's why I have that. Well, and the other thing that I guess I could say is this is not really, this is just, I don't even know if it's going to show up, but I got, uh, there's a new figurine on the way. So there's a dragon. This is a character in one of my books, which is not very popular. It's called Jade. One of my, one of, I, I just saw that some of my fans, who were some of my best fans, did not know that Jade was part of the Book of Deacon series. So, again, I'm a fine person to be talking about marketing, <laughs> but uh, that's a new figurine I'll be getting. It's going to go over on my shelf of cool stuff, which is not currently pictured. And um, that's by Emily Coleman, who is emilysculpts.com. She's very, very good. I very much uh, recommend her if you can get on her commission list. Nice. Uh, I definitely have to consider that. Cause I've like, I've had people ask me like, oh well, you know, I've seen you know, I've seen the like little dragon figurines. There's a lot of dragon artists out there. You gonna have one made? I'm like, eh, for what? Am I gonna have it sitting on my desk there? But I don't know. No, I, I thought is. about it. <laughs> You're having stuff to put on a shelf is one of the main reasons I spend money these days. <laughs> yeah, I know. I am totally bummed. I don't have a kraken or something sitting on my shelf. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I don't have a shelf this week because I'm chatting to you guys from Oregon. There's a bathroom down the hall. I shut the door, so hopefully that, that will not show up on the show. But uh, So, um, Jeff, I have to ask you, or no, Joe, is the uh, plan to eventually do a BookBub ad and, like, do it for 99 cents? or? I would like to eventually do, yeah, a deep discount on the, the bundle. I'm having a little bit of a hard time having, like, you know, you t tell the fans, if you've enjoyed any of these books, please put a, a review up. 
I haven't had a tremendous number of biters on that. Only one person has put a review up for it so far, but I'm going to do a newsletter push for that sort of thing soon. But yeah, eventually I want this to be like a book bug deal. Oh, and this is another book bug thing I realized, by the way. I did not know you actually can do a multi-author anthology on book bundle, uh, BookBub. The rules are they all have to be short stories and they all have to be uh, standalones, not previews. But you can indeed do a multi-author thing on BookBub. Short stories, so they don't want a humongo book or something on BookBub? Is less, than, less than 50, well they say less than 150 pages or less than 50,000 words. Uh, per story, yeah, they don't want. They don't. Basically, they're trying to specifically disallow the giant 15 book, you know, multi-author bundles that are that people use to try to get on bestseller lists. But the little, the, the standard, like the actual anthologies you might actually buy in a store are okay. Judging only by what I've seen on there so far, you probably need to have like a big name, <laughs> Hugo yeah. award-winning. Most of the ones I've seen, if not all, have been traditionally published anthologies. So mm -hmm. I don't know, but. Uh, Cool. Well, I hope that goes well. I'm kind of in the same place. I released one of my my encrypted, decrypted. They're both novels, and then there's a short story that goes in the middle. I smashed them into a bundle and released that like last month. And I haven't checked reviews. I think there's a few. I actually ordered some paperbacks from Create Space, so I thought I'd do a giveaway and bribe people to leave a review. I can't do that because it's a thousand pages plus. Well, I just did the the first book in the bundle. Yeah. I thought I'd give that away, signed paperbacks. Um, but I will say that I have before gotten BookBub ads with on a bundle with only like eight reviews. They'll they'll actually go and look at the other books, and if you've mm. got like hundred more than a hundred on those books, then uh, they seem to be interested. All right. Well, good. I I forgot about that actually. I remember them telling me that when I was pre-release, but I kind of went out of my head. Yeah, that was exactly. I had eight reviews on my Dragon Blood Dragon Blood box set when I, they accepted it. So, um, not much news for me. I did release my fifth book in that series last month after doing a pre-order for about five weeks. Kind of talked about that with. Uh, I think that was was it Rachel Aaron who was doing pre-orders? No, no, no. It was uh, Annie Belay, I think, who had done them and decided they're horrible and didn't want to do them anymore. Um, mine was fine. The only bad thing is I I got the file up in plenty of time, but then I sent typo copies out to people and got a list of typos back, and by that point it was too late to change the, you know, it was within the 10-day window. So I had like 4,000 copies that went out that, you know, had some typos in them, which, bad. you know, usually that's how it is on release weekend. I usually get the typo copies later, uh, but usually there's only a few hundred people that buy it in those first few days, and so I was like, oh, that... That kind of sucks. So if I do that again, I will give myself a little more time, if possible, so that I can <laughs> send those out and have time to get them back. And um, sales ranking, I think, was fine on it. it. It was a book five, so I wasn't really expecting like people to see it at the top of the list and buy it anyway. I figure, if anything, they'll go back and check out the box set, which is still 99 cents. Um, I think the highest it got was like 600 overall on the Amazon store, and usually I would definitely get higher or lower than that, as we'll discuss shortly. <laughs> uh, the one is the best ranking you can get. Uh, usually I would be more like around 200 or 300 for just a release weekend. Uh, my stuff doesn't usually stick until I go run some ads later on and do some sales, but um, not really a big deal though. It was pretty cool getting that much money in one weekend. And like in 24 hours I watched it cycle in. It, you know, like New Zealand I think was the first to hit midnight. and Rolls like across. Yeah, I'm getting Australian money. This is awesome. And then, so the next, the rest came, and it was pretty cool. That series is selling better than most of my stuff does, so that's not really typical for me to get that many sales. But um, pretty excited about that, and probably going to do a couple more because <clears throat> even though I always want to like jump around and work on lots of series at once, and I am going to jump around a little bit. The smart thing to do, <laughs> if you have one that's actually kind of taking off, is to focus on that one and uh, publish books until you're tired of them, sick and tired of them, or people are sick and tired of them. So uh, I'll try to definitely do a couple more. But that's it for news for me. Uh, Jeff, I forgot to say congratulations on your third novel. That's You're really like whipping along. Trying, now, anyways. After today's show, we got to get you to do like an advertising campaign and see if you can get your first book or one of them to stick and because you have enough books out now that like if you started selling just a little more it would have a big impact so 
I am all for it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, before we jump into our discussion, uh, let me just read. We had a couple emails come in a couple weeks ago, and we've had interviews the last couple weeks, so I didn't get a, a chance to respond to them on the air. Um, one was from Teresa. She was just kind of, this was a couple weeks ago, she asked if we could kind of explain our jargon a little bit more, which I think I mentioned already in a past show. But uh, So we're going to try to remember to do that. Um, we're trying to remember that not everybody has been doing this for years and knows everything. Uh, so we'll, that's one thing we'll do. And she also said, she, she asked kind of in her email, you know, what exactly is select versus wide and what's keyboards? Um, I already kind of said keyboards.com, specifically the Writer's Cafe thread or uh, forum. It's a big Kindle forum. It used to be called Kindle Boards until uh, Amazon told them not to use their trademark thing. <laughs> and uh, But anyway, it's a really big forum where a lot of indie authors hang out, and there's a lot of good advice. Uh, usually if you ask for help with a blurb or, you know, what do you guys think of my cover, people will respond. And, you know, there's a big thread going on there now about s people doing serials, what they found works, and, and what doesn't. So definitely a place to check out if you have not yet. Uh, with select versus going wide, we're just talking about if you enroll in Amazon Select when you sign up, that means you can only publish your book with Amazon at least for 90 days, and uh, you can't publish it anywhere else. And I've recently learned that's just the digital version. Like if you have an audiobook done, apparently that doesn't apply to that because I'm having an audiobook done, and <laughs> apparently it's not going to matter. So we'll see. And uh, going when we say going wide, we mean not choosing to be an Amazon Select, uh, you know, going on Barnes & Noble, Kobo, yeah, distributing through Smashwords or draft digital just trying to be everywhere. Uh, Google Play, I'm, I'm starting to get into them a little bit more now. I don't know, anybody else I didn't say? Oyster, Scribd, the little distribution sites that are out there. It, it's great to have multiple sources of income if you can get it. And uh, But sometimes in the beginning, there are perks from being in Amazon KDP Select, so that's why some people decide to start out that way. Or if they're not selling on the other platforms at all, they'll jump into KDP and see if they can do things like, uh, you know, they have it so every quarter you can do a countdown deal where you make your book either whatever price, 99 cents, let's say, for I think you can do up to seven days, five days, seven days. and uh, Or you can just make it free, and kind of these can make a promotion easier to work on. And uh, when you when you do have it at 99 cents through KDP Select, you will still get the 70 percent. So you're making you know 70 cents for each sale instead of 35. But uh, so there's a few little perks, and of course, right now being in Kindle Unlimited, which as we're going to talk about here shortly, uh, as far as I know right now, and uh, there's some we've seen some scientific studies. I'll, I'll link to a German publisher that did this last around Christmas or so, but. Uh, Right now, every borrow counts as much as a sale as far as affecting your sales ranking and visibility. So that's another reason some people are choosing to do KDP Select right now, at least with some of their stuff. Anyway, do you guys have any thoughts on that before I move on to the next email? Or I think I probably blabbed and answered everything. Uh, I think that's uh, pretty good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. I blabbed. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was going to say, I'm... I don't. I see. I, I'm not the one to ask about KDB Select because I'm still anti KDB Select. So I'll just shut up now. Yeah. No. It's if not for the pen name, I don't know anything either. That's the only thing I've tried it on. But uh, okay. So the next email, you know, I responded to this, but I thought I'd get you guys' thoughts too on it. This is Craig. He was asking um, whether or not a set of short stories would be a good lead-in into selling his first novel. He has six of them roughly planned out, all set in the same universe, exploring one theme, kind of similar, to, related to his debut novel, and they would run sequentially right up to the start of the story for the novel. And he's wondering, should I spend time finishing these while resting the novel and getting it edited, with the intent of releasing them during my book's pre-order phase, or do you think I'd be better off just getting started on book two in the series? He's got five books planned total. I would say. 
definitely try and and start working on number two because if you, as soon as you get a mul more than one book in the same series, then you can certainly try the permafree bit and try and get your book out there as much as possible. I mean, the short stories are nice. They they usually like you know, a lot of a lot of fans really like the short stories, especially if you're using the same characters and it ties into the same you know world that you created. Because a lot of people like to say like, oh, what happened to this? Or oh, it'd be interesting to learn about that. And that's what the short stories typically accomplish. But uh, I would definitely root for going for the the second book in the series. Um, I would say you know novels are are better than short stories for almost any sales purpose or marketing purpose, but if the short stories are done and ready, uh, I don't think there's any reason not to put them out if it's going to take a lot of effort to get them ready and, and or, you, you know, if nothing's going to slow down the release of the other books, then put them out because the more stuff, the better. Plus, I've already, I like, we'll, we'll talk about newsletter perks or so, sort of thing where you give away a book to, to anyone on your newsletter to encourage people to sign up. We've, I've discovered, or at least it, it appears to be, People are more apt to do that if the if the thing you're putting in as your perk has already been released somewhere. So even if the short stories turn out not to be particularly uh, uh, useful as a marketing tool in that regard, just having them on the, the the Amazon site and then saying, "Oh, I'm going to give this away for free to anybody who does uh, who signs up for my newsletter," suddenly there's value attached to that thing. It's not just a throwaway story, but an actual thing they would have had to buy otherwise. So. I think there's value to put them out, but if it's going to slow down a novel release, I don't think I, I would say prioritize novels. Yeah, that was pretty much my response too. I think one short story could be a good idea, especially when you only have one novel out. You can then make the short story free, which is actually exactly what I did, and it's kind of the first thing I did that started increasing sales. So I had the same characters that were in the novel, the first novel. I had a short story with them, and then I put an excerpt to the novel at the back, just a few pages and uh, made the short story free on Barnes and & Noble and, and everywhere besides Amazon because I didn't know about price matching back then. But, um, and it, it worked. Uh, but yeah, as far as doing like five short stories, I've just not found that people were as likely to buy them. And uh, I would definitely put the effort towards writing the second novel instead. Because I, I think, this is just me speaking, but I think it would take me almost as much work to do five short stories as it would to write another novel. Because you have to come up with completely new ideas and I don't know, just... It seems harder to me to. <laughs> it's still five stories versus just one story. I don't know if, how you guys feel about that, but. <laughs> well, I, I know full well. I know some of you guys. You know, if you start a short story, have a tendency to morph into full-blown novels. So, <laughs> I'll just. For me, though, I've I've written a couple of short stories, but I usually just use them as you know, like little perks to, for like the fans you know like I, I wrote one for it was winter based you know I, I think a couple of Christmases ago and said oh here's my Christmas present to the fans here enjoy and they absolutely loved it so yeah I've heard yeah, a, go ahead <laughs> <laughs> my short stories do grow into novellas and novels I've always had a little bit of difficulty with them but they're starting, to, they're starting to get better I'm starting to find the areas that they're useful for they're very good for collaborative works like again like anthologies and bundles yeah, I think my short stories have all gone up into the 10,000 word range at least. And I just submitted a novella under my pen name for an anthology. And I think most people's are like 20, 25,000 words. And my novella was 46,000 words, <laughs> which some people would consider a novel, you know. I think when we had Annie on, she was saying her novels were like 40,000 words. I'm like, that's a, you're calling that a novel? Can, can I do that? Can I, can I publish a novella? Because people are more likely to buy novels than novella so I don't know we'll see but yeah to, to answer your question Craig it, you know I, I already told him his answer he's probably got three books out by now but uh, <laughs> I think that we have you know we're saying go for the go for the next novel I think instead unless it's just for something for fun and uh, that's all the email stuff I have since we still don't have a contact form and it's not easy to find us <laughs> so far people have been emailing us directly I think uh, but we'll get there eventually. Once we hit one year on this podcast, we're going to get serious about it. You know, we're going to get like good lighting and uh, maybe microphones, that kind of stuff. All right, but let's jump into talking about the Amazon stuff. Um, first off, you know, and the reason we're focusing on Amazon is because it's actually for all that we say that people don't know exactly how the algorithm alg ah, algorithms work. It's actually the easiest site to for an indie author to really make some headway on. It seems to be that case anyway. Every now and then you'll hear from somebody that's like done well at iTunes or Kobo, but usually with the other sites, there's a 
kind of a curation process. It seems like you kind of have to get picked by somebody, whereas Amazon is strictly on the bots. It's based solely on like how well your book is doing, possibly a little bit on how many reviews you got, although some people say that that doesn't matter at all for a uh, uh, it doesn't. It shouldn't matter for sales ranking. It may matter for the algorithms and things like uh, Amazon autom automatically emails people. Like if your book is like another book and if it's sold a lot of copies and people are buying it, then it might get an, e an email to like other fantasy fans or other science fiction fans. So, But um, just to start off, let's kind of talk about what the sales ranking is and what it means. Um, I guess for most people this would be pretty obvious, but you know we say we want a good sales ranking. What we actually want is a low number in the Amazon store. Like I said, the best selling book in the Amazon store is book number one. You know, and um, this it used to be believed that, and I just going by old blog posts and stuff I've read that uh, it used to weight things like so much per hour, uh, more more weight per, and then a little bit of weight per day, like the sales history of the book, how well it's done maybe up to a month in the past. It seems that most of the times I'm seeing now that people are saying that it's really just kind of how, how well the book's doing right now, like within the last 24 hours. Um, possibly a book that's been selling really well might be harder to dethrone, might get a little extra uh, weight for the fact that it's got a good sales history. and it, So it's harder to actually get a new book up there to stick and Let's say you're trying to be in the top 500 or just the top five of your particular category. It, it seems to be a little harder to get a new book to stick than one that's, you know, been occupying that spot for for months and just has a real steady sales record. Um, do you guys have any thoughts on that, or have you seen the same thing? I've pretty much seen the same thing. It's, I mean, I know full well that everyone's everyone's like, oh yeah, let's go ahead and release your book, and I can't wait for it to get to number one, and then they're disappointed when it sticks or stays in, let's say, the twenty, thirty thousand range. There, I was like, well, yeah, I know twenty, thirty thousand, yeah, it could be better, but you know what? You know how many books are available out there, so it's not you know necessarily too bad, especially if you're just getting started out there. But uh, yeah, it, it it can be it can be rough at first. Yeah, um, like the whole new release versus. Uh, uh, I feel like on other, I, I know for sure on other sites like iTunes, new releases are weighted very heavily in rankings. Like you could sell barely, barely anything on a new book, but it will outrank all the rest of your books because they weight new releases better than old releases. I, I have not found that to be the case for Amazon. New releases tend to be higher ranked on Amazon, but that's because people tend to buy books most on the opening days. So you just happen to have more sales on the new release and therefore it's ranked higher. But yeah, I, I've also found that it tends to be a lot more mobility on your rank on Amazon. Like you can you can compete with the big boys in your early days if you have enough uh, if you have enough sales quickly enough. Right. And it, then it seems to be that like you can with your fans, you know, with your newsletter, you can go in and maybe you can get a thousand sales in a weekend eventually or a couple hundred. Uh, I should say that you can stick at different levels. We all want to stick up really high and sell tons of book, of course, but I've had cases where I've stuck like in the top two, 2,000 overall in the sales in the store. And, you know, if you've got a book that's 399 or something, that's, you know, you're still making really good money on that. I'd love to be one of those romance authors that's in the top hundred for, <laughs> for weeks and weeks, but uh, that doesn't happen yet. Um, but yeah, my best-selling one, and this is, uh, like I was saying, the Dragon Blood Collection, books one to three. It's 99 cents. For a while, this was I had a BookBub ad back in January, and as I was saying on earlier shows, I've done that a lot, and usually my stuff doesn't stick, but this one did. I think it's kind of a combination of the blurb I did kind of had a wide appeal that could cross from steampunk to swords and sorcery to epic fantasy, and uh, because it really fits in the steampunk genre I've got it there and it's been number one for or close you know something will knock it out now and then but it's really stuck up there for you know what is it now almost July and uh, it's up the sales ranking is 653 right now as I'm looking at this, this overall in the store so it seems like you can try really hard to sell a lot of books over a couple of days and we'll talk about how we do advertising campaigns or how I do them in, in a few minutes but you do and then you need something you need like a really good cover just that or a cover that other people think are really good besides you. Like sometimes I think my covers are cool, but <laughs> the rest of the world doesn't agree. And you need a blurb that just has that wider appeal and a, a good title. Like we've talked about, joked about dragons. Oh yeah, dragons are hot in fantasy. And it's true if you've got dragons 
even if my dragon doesn't come into the fourth book. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so you know, I think if you're like a mystery or a thriller author, or just in a romance, of course, in a genre that has really broad appeal, you maybe have a better chance overall. It's gonna be really tough if you write like say steampunk and it can't cross over. Like this series of mine is very. Um, like I said, it's definitely got epic fantasy elements and kind of swords and sorcery, or at least, well, there's a talking sword, so it's definitely swords, but uh, it's a little more advanced civilization. But uh, and you know, and there's like always a luck element too. Like like I said, I never, I wouldn't have guessed. I really thought when the when I got the cover, I was like, oh, it's okay, you know. Um, but it's done really well, and of course, it, it doesn't hurt that you've got three books in a set for 99 cents. I mean, I, all the power to those people that can sell one for five bucks and. <laughs> a single book and, and have it stick in the top 500 or something. Maybe someday I'll, I'll have something like that. Uh, in science fiction and fantasy, dystopian seems to be kind of that genre that I see a lot of times enough of a broad appeal maybe that, you know, it's popular enough it'll stick. And uh, urban fantasy is another one, the contemporary fantasy that seems to have enough readers that they can possibly stick up there kind of high. But, uh, I don't know, but anyways, as I was saying with my set, it just, it seems like once you can get there, you can actually stick. Like, I've done nothing to promote it. I think I did one on a, one other ad since then to keep it there. So that's what we all covet, you know. We all, we're all trying to get stuff to stick, and uh, that's the best I can say is, like, broad appeal, good cover, um, you know, and then, like, you're kind of right there in the tropes for your genre, if you can be. And it doesn't hurt to be 99 cents, but like I said, people will, especially if you're in Kindle Unlimited too, and you can get people borrowing, and that counts for, towards your sales ranking. A more expensive book can can definitely do well. But uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I couldn't agree more about the the books and the covers because yeah, I mean, there's so many people that say if you're looking for a mystery book, and you see a nice haunted mansion looking thing on the cover, you're like. Mm. Let's read the description. Let's see what it says. It's enough to get you to stop. Just like fantasy, you know, as you're saying, if this is a dragon on the cover, most people will stop and take a look just to see if it's, you know, the description catches their fancy. But so, again, I can't stress enough how important a good-looking cover is because there's a lot of people that, unfortunately, are like myself. When I'm looking for a new book, I'm flipping through the covers fairly quickly, and if I see one that catches my eye, I'll stop long enough to read the description, eh, and I'll move on. You, you, know, you don't have that long to catch a person's attention. Yeah. Um, also, I gotta agree with the cover. Really, everything we've said about how to get, you know, all the marketing rules that we've talked about in all these podcasts are what will get you to to go up and and stay up in the in the rankings. And a cover is is very very important. And uh, also, although we're probably not gonna talk about author rankings right now, uh, consistent covers across a series are very effective if you want to get sell through because people will be immediately be able to recognize the next, the other books in the same series. But yeah, the wide appeal obviously is necessary. Good covers are, are absolutely necessary. I don't have a whole lot of experience with blurbs because blurbs are among my greatest weaknesses. So I know that they make a big difference, but I couldn't tell you how to do them effectively just yet. You and me both. <laughs> it is easier to write a damn book than to try and sum up your book in like, two paragraphs. It's just so freaking hard to do. Some people can say, oh yeah, sure, no problem. I've actually had the last couple of books, I've had fans that have actually read the book, you know, the, the, when they're doing my proofreading, and they're like, a beta readers are like, this is what I would put. And I'm listening to them like, dude, that's good. I'm going to put that. Do you mind? And they're like, no, go right ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm flattered that you would. I'm like, oh, can I keep you on retainer? Because I've got another book I need you to read. But yeah, it's hard. Yeah, I'd like to say I'm awesome at it too after 20 novels or whatever, but that's not really the case. <laughs> the only thing I've learned is, uh, like I said, try to do the broad appeal and the blurb. Even if your book is original and doesn't follow the tropes that well, pick out the ones that it does follow <laughs> and highlight those. And, you know, we should, if you haven't, uh, maybe we can get her on the show someday. Libby Hawker has a book out called, I think it's Gotta Have It. It's all about how to write a, a really effective blurb, and she's been on some of the other podcasts, so you could look her up or check out her book. I think it's only two ninety nine. Um, she wrote a book yeah. how to write a blurb. Yeah, how to write good book descriptions. It's like it's probably twenty or thirty thousand page or, uh, words. You know, it's not like a huge monster text, but it's it's all the information you need to know and. Dude, very put useful. a li put a link to that in the show notes, <laughs> would you? That'd be helpful. Okay, I will. I was going to look it up. 
I, I just want to look it up to see how good the blur the blurb is because I mean you'd think it'd be the <laughs> yes. best one on the entire store. And she's got some videos on her site too. If I remember, I'll try to link to them. It's actually goes through exactly what she talks about in the book. She's got like two like a twenty minute video or something like that. So, and yeah, as much as we want to say like it's the writing is what matters. For getting people to buy your first book, it's not the writing. You're getting them to buy book two, book three, book four in the series, that's the writing. you got to be awesome there if you want them to go on. But the first book, it's the cover, it's the blurb, it's the title. Sad to say, it put all of your money in that first book, and then you can have crappy covers on the, <laughs> the rest of the books in this series once you've got them sucked in if, uh, you, know, if you want to. You probably... Yeah, Pride won't it, allow that. <laughs> yeah, when, when it comes to the first book in a series, unfortunately, you do judge a book by its cover. <laughs> I'm sorry to say, but my, most people do anyways. I'm one of them. All right, kind of moving on, we were going to talk about like why spots in top 100s of categories are so desirable. And it's part of like making your book stick is people have to see it. And there's only so many ways on Amazon that people are going to just stumble across your book. You know, people will browse the top 100 categories in whatever genre they like to read. They'll see your book in the also bots for other books by authors maybe that they've read. But to start appearing in the also bots for like really popular authors, you have to have sold a lot of books. So first thing most people kind of shoot for is the top 100 in a category. And um, as I was saying with my steampunk series, I think it's really useful if you can, there's some category that you can fit into that's not that competitive. So when I say my book was one, number one in steampunk for a long time, I need to tell you here that it doesn't take much to get into the steampunk category. I'm going to go look at what the, the 20th book in the category right now has a sales ranking of 17,000. So probably in all the fantasy, or I guess it's a science fiction category, that's probably one of, it's got to be, if not the least competitive, one of the most least competitive um, to get in the top 100. You know, I'll draw it up here, but I think you only need like, a, let's check, Cogs in Time too. Hello, SJ Davis has a, a sales ring of 60,000. And, you know, if you've browsed around other categories on Amazon, like I think to get in a contemporary romance, the top 100, you need like a sales ranking of 200. Like half the top, books out there are contemporary romance. So if you can be in one small category and then also be in some other ones, or maybe like if you're 20 or 30 or 40 or something, it's still a little visibility. It can, it can definitely help. And uh, if, if that's not your book, so be it. Like I, I, my whole Emperor's Edge series for the longest time, all I could do is put it in epic fantasy. And that's not even, wasn't like a great fit. But um you know, if if you can, if you're just thinking like right now, should I write this story or should I write this story? Pit, write the one that will fit nicely into a category, preferably not a super competitive one. So, because uh, if you're in those top 100s, you're more visible, you'll get more sales, especially if you're in the top 20. Uh, I think this was Joe's note. Somebody wrote that <laughs> we have our little notes we're going by. Yep. You know, if you can, is it better to be in top twenty, top three, number one? Did you want to talk about that a little bit, or of course uh, it's better to be number one. But <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, I, I, I w when you when you start ranking high enough up in the category or overall, there's like a couple of tiers that are most important. And top one hundred is important because it's sort of the largest tier that you might actually see. Like somebody might be browsing. Nobody's going to be browsing the top ten thousand. But the top 100 is set aside into pages of 20, and those are set, you know, set aside from the rest of the book. So if you can break the top 100, it's very important. If you can break the top 20, it's even more important because, again, they're broken up into pages of 20. So if you're in the top 20, you're on page one of the top books of your of your section. And uh, once you get to like the top three, then you might start showing up on other pages that aren't the top 100 of that. They like the top books in the genre. There's always like a group of three books that are like the hottest and best sellers. So when you're getting toward the top three, you got a shot of being in those little tiny summary things that show up on other pages. And of course, number one is number one. Not only do you, are you at the very top of your of your rank, but you get bragging rights. Number one bestseller and blah, 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 blah. Like you have a blurb now that you can add on to something. It's never, it's never not a big deal to hit number one on any list in uh, uh, Amazon. So Hitting a good rank is important, but the four ranks that are most important are top 100, top 20, top 3, and top 1, which is number 1. 
Yeah, and you'll actually see in the also bots, like right now I'm on one of my other Dragon Blood books I have pulled up, and I see it actually says for the Dragon Blood collection books one through three, it says number one bestseller in steampunk fiction. This is in the also bots on another book's page. So it's sort of like, wow, this this really cool badge of social proof. People are like, I'm going to check that out. That's the number one best-selling book. So even though there's uh, four or five, I guess, books in the also bots, you know, that one, that's the only one that says number one bestseller. So there's definitely, like Joe was saying, that's that's good. Anything that can help you on Amazon, make you stand out. And uh, you, yeah, if you're in the, you, if you're in the top 20, chances are you might also be in, make that new releases sidebar over on the side because they show three books. And if, you know, the other stuff's been there for a while, you might be there and just and any extra places you can appear on Amazon. And it seems like, like we're talking about the algorithms, but it's just like the more pages there are that link to the page of your book, the more likely people are going to find your book. So Amazon rewards those books that are already selling well by, you know, it's, it's sort of self-perpetuating. And um, if you're not able to get up there, you're struggling, you're working all this hard, you know, you're on social media, you're on face Facebook, you're trying to pimp books and sell them, and it seems like you're just clawing and clawing and can't get up there. Because you do need to sell kind of a lot of books in a short period of time to, to first get there, first stick up there. And, I don't know, let's see what we have next on our list. How Amazon algorithms work to sell books. So that's it. <laughs> you know, it's everybody wants to be there, everyone wants to stick. And uh, like uh, I think it was Jeff was saying, you can stick at uh, different levels. Like if you've, you know, let's say right now you're in 800,000 sales ranking and selling a book a week or two books a month, you know, even doing what we're going to talk about with advertising, even if you can just do a small campaign and maybe sell books and, you know, maybe suddenly you're selling five, ten books a day, it could become self-perpetuating in that way too, in that you'll stick, stick at, say, that 30,000 30, sales ranking level it, it seems to be like different levels, different areas that you can stick in, and so I don't know. <laughs> I'm happy you know, <laughs> with any with any level that I'm not actively having to promote. If I can stick there, that's great for me. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually hit one when uh, my my first pre-order, which was my seventh book there. It was a direct sequel. I remember that I was telling you about the cliffhanger that I did for the one book, and thankfully I was able to release it the very next month. And uh, I, I hit a new, uh, one of those little tiers there that I didn't realize existed was because people are pre-ordering the my seventh book like crazy because they finished that one there. I go like, what the hell? A cliffhanger? You son of a... Oh, look! It's available for pre-order. So I went checking on it one day, and I saw that was the hot what do they call it? The number one hot new release, in this case, in time travel. And uh, while I was looking at the kind of keeping an eye on the books, I see this new badge thing that popped up for the book. I'm like, I'm taking screen caps of the thing. I'm like saving the picture there. I'm posting on the blog. Oh, man, you're not going to look at this. This is really cool. Thanks so much. So, yeah, it's it, once you can get up there, you know, and that's where pre orders are really good for. You know, if people are ordering it, even the pre orders will, will hit them eventually, too. Yeah, I should say with pre-orders, with my experience was I had that same thing with being in the new hot new releases. Um, fortunately, because my other the first four books in the series were selling well, the fifth one started selling on the pre-orders pretty well, and it hit the hot new releases. Usually, you can only be in that category for 30 days, and then your book is no longer a hot new release. But I put the pre-order up in early May. It was in the hot releases all the way to release date in mid-June, and uh, it's still in the hot new releases now. So pre-orders, if you can gets your sales ranking if it can stick for long enough. If, if you're selling enough books, you can potentially be in that hot new releases category for months as opposed to just the 30 days. So extra little visibility. So, you know, there's some pros and cons with pre-orders. It's like we said, you don't get the big bump, big sales bump right at the beginning. So you might not get, your book might not stick up high like you're hoping. But most of our stuff never sticks high anyway, but even though we're hoping. Usually it's an accident when it happens. You're all excited, like, oh, what did I do? I need to do that again. Uh -huh. All right. Next, let's just, we kind of talked about it already, but let's briefly talk about Kindle Unlimited and why that kind of changes things as far as sales ranking and the algorithms and everything go. Um, as I was saying before, a borrow, as of right now, it seems to be the case that a borrow counts for as much as a sale. 
But as we've talked about on the show before, a borrow can be a lot easier to come by because for anybody who is signed up for Kindle Unlimited, this is the subscription service for Amazon. They pay $10 a month. They can read as many ebooks as they want. I think they can check out 10 at a time, something like that. Uh, for anybody that's subscribed and paying that $10, anything in the Kindle Unlimited store is free to them. So it's almost like a no-brainer for them to try something that looks even vaguely interested. Interesting. They're not buying it. They're just it's like a free book. They're like, yeah, I'll download it. I'll try it. So I think it's a lot easier to come by that than even a 99 cent sale. So what that means right now is that people who are in KDP Select have a an advantage in that in that area because all of their borrows are counting towards their sales ranking, adding to their visibility, making it helpful that um, possibly they can stick. And uh, just as I've seen myself, anecdotal evidence, since none of my stuff that really sells that well, my, my own stuff is in Kindle Unlimited. But I've seen other, I've seen authors come out of nowhere this last year and uh, with a good cover and a good blurb and stick at like 500 or 600 overall in the sales store. You know, like an epic fantasy book, not even a romance or something that you would think, oh yeah, those are, those are super popular. So, and I think a lot of that is Kindle Unlimited because I always look and like, yep, they're in Kindle Unlimited. So people are just grabbing it. They're like, cool cover. Oh, I'm going to borrow that. So and maybe it's a good story, maybe not. But I think that right now, if you think you can finance an advertising campaign to, to do, you know, to maybe get up there and sell enough books in a short period of time that you could stick, um, Maybe Kindle Unlimited is a good idea for you or KDP Select for at least a 90-day period to check it out. Um, some people will put their new releases in it for 90 days and then move it out to the other sites. Um, haven't done this with any of my own stuff yet. Uh, I think I've said before, like the guys, we I got started back in December 2010 before KDP Select was a thing, and I already had readers on the other platforms. And I, I feel like I was betraying them if you know, something new wasn't available for them. So that's why I've only done it with the pen name. But, you know, you have to think about it. It's like, well, I might tick off a few people, but if I could sell, like, way more books on Amazon, would it be worth it? And I, I will say from what I've heard from people, if you're not able to, like, get at least uh, below 100,000 sales ranking, then it's probably not worth it. It's probably not going to make a difference for you to be in Kindle, Kindle Unlimited. It's just not enough. You're not getting enough sales. You don't have enough visibility that, you you know, these people will probably only get maybe a borrow here and there. Yeah, it really needs to be part of a plan where you're going to say, okay, I'm going to do this marketing thing and uh, I'm going to be able to get that extra visibility. Uh, I guess since I've been teasing it, do you guys have anything to say on Kindle Unlimited? Unlimited? <laughs> probably not since you're not in it, but let me check with you since I've been talking and talking. I don't know, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, I, I'm not in Kindle Unlimited, but uh, I do I do feel like if you don't already have a fan base, then that's definitely like give it a try. But if you do have a fan base that and you have people like if you know the names of a, of fans who only read on Nook, then you're going to irritate some fans. So I've avoided it almost exclusively for that reason. Yeah, I, I've had I've had th fans that threaten I me. Mean, it's like, don't you ever consider going to that KDB Select thing? Because I want to make certain that I can get the book the same time everyone else does. I'm like, yeah, yeah no, I'm, I'm good. Don't worry about it. I won't ever do that to you. So you know, I've got Kobo fans, Nook fans, Apple iTunes fans. I mean, I can't just single out one comp one group of them. And say, okay, you get the books. The rest of you are gonna wait for three months. That would not go over well. <laughs> Yeah, I've thought about it for like a, an entirely new series. I'm like, well, then they wouldn't be like waiting. It's not a cliffhanger or something, but I still haven't gone through with it. I, I just, the pen name is a way to play around with it without offending people. But even the pen name now has some readers on Barnes & Noble and stuff. So <laughs> she gets emails if uh, they're wondering why they can't get all their books. <laughs> it's hard to please the readers. They don't understand that Amazon is pitting us against everybody against the readers, against the other sites. It is kind of tough if you choose not to be in it and you see people that probably are not selling any better than you having a higher sales ranking and more visibility because they are in Kindle Unlimited. But it's still possible to, uh, to rank well without them. Uh, so I guess I've, I've been teasing you, so let's talk about what does it take right now to get books to stick. Um, we already talked about kind of broad appeal, awesome covers, awesome blurbs, and it helping if you can be in a small category as well as some bigger categories. 
Uh, I wouldn't say just do romance just because you want to be in a really popular category because it's really going to be hard to get in that top 100. Like I said, top 200, it takes 200, better than a 200 sales ranking to get in the top 100 of contemporary fantasy. So it's like, who gets that? Nobody gets that starting out. Uh, I, I don't get that now after 20 books. So. Well, it's like what you were mentioning before. You, you said like all, like all the steampunk authors, you know, there's not that many of them. So you make a few sales and you, you've hit the list there. Where if you're going to try your luck at a romance author, you know, do you know how many romance authors are out there? It's you know, hundreds if not thousands of them that are out there. So you're competing with a whole heck of a lot more people. So if you can pick one of those little obscure genres there or categories, go for it. Yeah, if you're going to do romance, you need to do like time travel romance or something that uh, is less competitive, although that has all those... Romance. <laughs> no, that's not a category, unfortunately, but uh, the time travel romance has all those outlander books, in it, so that kind of sucks too, so the top ten is just taken, sorry, but uh, I think it only doesn't take that much to get in the top 100 there, though, but yeah, it, it definitely pays to kind of poke around, and um, we're going to talk more about categories briefly, kind of how to work that but uh just uh let me say let me say what's hap what's working for me right now and what i see working for people on the keyboards the writers cafe as far as initially making your book stick um hope possibly well this is what we used to see is you used to get a book bub ad and they used to stick that was just a guarantee if you could sell 2000 books overnight you were going to stick for a while and uh, same thing if you have a big mailing list if you released a you know send out an email letter Sorry about squirming so much, guys. I'm on a wooden chair. <laughs> it's really uncomfortable <laughs> traveling this week. But anyway, uh, so if you could send out a newsletter and sell 2,000 copies, um, you would stick up there somewhere. But it seems like Amazon kind of got wise to that, to the book bub effect especially. I don't think they care about newsletter emails. I mean, that's what you're supposed to do as an author. But they would see people who got a book bub and it was like, score, you're winning the lotto because then you would stick up there for a while, especially if you had a broad appeal book. So they seem to have made it now where if you just do an ad and you just get 1,000, 2,000 sales, uh, almost immediately, like if all those sales come in like 24 hours, almost immediately, maybe you're good for like a few days, but then you start dropping back down again and eventually kind of return, the book can return to where it was before. So what's working for people is to try to like set up numerous ads on the different sites. Like if you and BookBub's a big one. Uh, E-reader News Today is another pretty good one. And then there's a lot of smaller sites. There's Kindle Nation Daily, which I've never broken even with, but <laughs> some people speak fondly of them. Uh, Bargain Booksy. You know, we had um, I think was it on the show that we had Carolyn Gockel on here? Do you guys remember? <laughs> I'm on too many podcasts, I don't remember. But um, she has a big list of like just all the sites you can do. And I think I've linked to it before, but I can try to remember to link to that again in the, in the show notes for this one. And uh, she lists all the sites that uh, advertise 99 cent books or free ebooks. And so you can just kind of go through, or you can go on keyboards and ask like, hey guys, wh which sites are working well right now? There's a lot of them that only charge 5 or $10. They don't sell a lot of books, but maybe you sell a few. So you, but what you try to do is stack it. So let's say you're lucky enough to get a book bub ad, and if not them, like e-reader news today is also a pretty good one. So you get one for like July 8th, and then what you want to do is like go back and try to get smaller ads for July 7th, July 6th, July 5th, July 4th. You know, try to like get as many sales as you, as you can over like five days, with um, the the big one culminating at the end if you can work it that way. Uh, you know, usually since some of those sites like e-reader news today and especially bookbub are hard to get you kind of try to get that first don't count on getting that and then because now what I've started doing this year is if I get one I'm like oh yeah then I go and try to get a bunch of other ones to wrap around it and what that seems to do is Amazon seems to like that more right now speaking in uh, June 30th 2015 you never know what will continue to work if you can sell a bunch of books over a few days it that seems to be enough to make you stick um, I got lucky with the Dragon Blood set back in January. That was the only ad I had scheduled. This was the one time this worked. I've like I've probably done 12 BookBub ads over the years now, if not more. And um, 
the, I think it was just that there was 99 cents and it was a box set. It was such a good deal and the cover or whatever just worked for people. So that one sold like 4,000 copies in that 24 hours and that was enough to get it in epic fantasy, steampunk, blah, blah, to, uh, to kind of stick. And, uh, you know, you're trying to work the algorithms right, but you're also trying to, you have to appeal to a bunch of people. Like, you get your chance to be number one or number two for however many days these ads go off for and last for, but people have to want to actually buy it at that point. It's not like Amazon algorithms force people to open their wallet and buy your book. So you also, you know, you have to hope that it sticks. And that's sometimes, who knows, you know, like the the book you think is awesome and has the best cover and the best blurb may not be the one that actually sticks. That's why I say we always say like keep writing more books because the more books you have out, the more series you have out, the more chances you kind of have of maybe hit, finding your lottery ticket and, and if not even, if not winning a million dollars, at least you know getting a nice little payoff there for a little while. So stacking the ads basically is the thing right now. So save your money. Uh, if you get that book bub ad, it's going to be expensive. Uh, at least in fantasy and science fiction, it's not too crazy. I think I just, my pen name just got one, and I think it was three, $390 for a $0.99 cent ad. So I'm pretty much banking on that selling at least 1,200 copies and paying for itself. Usually with book bub, that does happen with me. We'll see with the pen name stuff. It's not as good of a match. It's a... Uh, it's actually a time travel romance. Speaking of time travel, <laughs> time travel romances, and so I think it's going to be in the paranormal romance section. I always think my stuff is more solidly sci-fi, but they want their romance stuff to all go together. But um, anyway, let me see if you guys have anything to say <laughs> on this topic now. Um, I really don't have to tell you the truth. I mean, I, I'm still trying to get a book bub ad, but apparently, though, they keep looking like, yeah, we'll pass this time. Like. I'll turn around and try it again here. So I don't have much to contribute on this section. Uh, I, I'll agree that uh, advertising, particular you know, stacking ads is is important for a couple of reasons because ads don't usually hit the same people. So even if there's not a whole lot that see the the lesser ads, those are in addition to what we'll be getting on the bigger ads. And advertising always has there's a long tail on every every ad. A book bub, you're gonna see you're gonna have a measurable you know, dozens of sales, ideally, dozens of sales per day will continue for a while, even if it wasn't a huge, like, it didn't, even didn't make you stick, it'll trail off a little bit. And when you have a sequence of ads, those long tails stack. So maybe you only get a couple of dozen, you know, well, maybe you only get two or three uh, additional book sales for the next couple of days, but those two or three are going to stack with the two or three from the last one and then two or three after it, and pretty soon you're getting a couple of dozen extra sales and then the big one hits, so... Yeah, the the multi prong attack is uh, uh, definitely your best bet to purposely make your book stick, or certainly to get reasonably high in the ranks. All right, I got a camel like filling himself up behind me. So if you hear drinking noises, it's not me. I was hoping you'd talk a little longer so he would finish. <laughs> but uh, no, that goes back to kind of what we were saying. Even if you can't get not everybody's going to get in the top 500, even the top 1,000, but like if you can you can do this ad thing, stacking the ads at a lesser level. He's really thirsty. I don't know if you guys can hear him. <laughs> Still going at it. It's not terribly audible. It's not too bad. <laughs> I'm in the high desert country here, you know. <laughs> All right, but uh, so even if you can just stick at a lower level, it's still probably going to be better than you were doing before. Like, if you're going from, like, 500,000 sales ranking and you can stack these ads and, you know, you can do it to a lesser extent, maybe that you're at that 30,000 level and you're selling a book or two every day. So it, it's definitely possible. And I was going to say, for Jeff, even if you can't get a book by bad, you can try this with the smaller sites. Um, E-Reader News Today seems to be kind of easy to get into right now. And it's not very expensive. It's something like twenty dollars for if you want to advertise a ninety-nine cent fantasy or science yeah, fiction yeah, book. I've used, them, I've used them a couple times. They're actually actually not too bad. Yeah, and if, like I said, if you can try to get a few there right within a few days, and this can all work with free books too. You just don't get as much of a payoff. But if your only goal is to try to get more people to be exposed to your books and to get into your series, there's nothing wrong with that. I'll still do that with free books too. Um, I'm liking the 99 cent box set right now, though. That's uh, it. Seems like if you can get th your first three books into people's hands, they're and they're committed because they paid for it. I don't know. A lot of those people seem to go on and buy the, the other books in the set. So 
I'll be curious to watch how Joe does with his new boxed set. I'm probably not going to give it too hard of a push until closer to the release of the next book because it literally has every book in the series in it. I had to because my books are priced so low that I couldn't get the price. Like, I couldn't get it to a, uh, I want to call it a premium price point without putting everything else in it. So if I get a, if I get to stick really high and then I have to wait until November for the next book that might have you know buy through, that's not going to work out so well. So I'm going to I'm not going to give it too hard of a shove until we get toward November. Yeah, I would do the same thing for sure. Um, and what I've seen too is people will do the 99 cent sale, and I just left mine at 99 cent because it just increased my bottom line so much because I have more books for people to buy in the series. But a lot of people will do this thing with the ads, and they'll get pretty high in the rankings with the 99 cents. You know, there was somebody on Keyboards not that long ago that was shooting for the U.S. A today bestseller list and made it. I think he sold six or seven thousand books in over the course of a week. And um, that was kind of his goal. And then he put his book, you know, after a while, he put his box set up to like three ninety nine, I think, or maybe four ninety nine. And uh, it continued to sell well. It's um, it didn't stick like in the hundreds, but I think the last time I looked, it was like sales ringing at five thousand. And if you're thinking about a set that was doing hardly anything before, you know, five thousand is good. That's uh, you know, I don't know how many books a day that is right now. It changes. We should have said that that it's all relative based on how many other books are selling. When I got started, a 40,000 sales ranking, I remember, I specifically remember was about one book sale a day because I was really excited if I could get one book sale a day and have that ranking. And I think, it, you know, there's a lot more books being sold right now and a lot more books out there, so it takes more. But, um, so yeah, that's something, too, to think of is not just uh, when you have more books out, you know, you don't have to leave it at 99 cents, and it's more impressive possibly if you put the price back up if not to full price to like three ninety nine or four ninety nine, and then you're making some serious cash if you're in like the top five hundred on Amazon. All right, so next category, next category, <laughs> next topic. We're going to talk a little bit about categories, and I think this was Joe that put this in here. So, do you want to talk a little bit about kind of understanding categories and what they can do to help you expose expose you to more readers? I know we've already talked about this, but <laughs> if you had some more to say there. Um, this was, I don't think, actually, I was the one who put this on here, but I'm going to weigh in first. Ah, <laughs> oh, just <laughs> snuck it in. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to just say a couple of words on it, but, yeah, categories are, we, we were talking about, I'll, I'll actually tie this into what we just said before, so it's gonna, be careful not to step on anything that, that Jeff might say, but uh, we were talking about how categories and minor categories, you can score higher in, if you go down to the mid-level of, of your Amazon sales page, they now have your ranks, no matter how low you are ranked in your subcategories, they still have your ranks there. For a while, it was only if you were in the top 100 of that of, of those subcategories. Like, ranking in categories is going to be on your page. It's going to build reader confidence. Like, if there's somebody who likes your cover and likes your title and likes your blurb but still doesn't know because, ah, I've never heard of this, if they go down and they see, oh, well, it's, you know, number 85 in Epic Fantasy... This must be good. So that's one of the ways that categories are important. And now I'll move it off to the person who originated the topic. <laughs> now I was just going to mention something I had uh, I had noticed before, and I've actually I've something I'd read and something I personally noticed where they were saying that when you choose your categories, you know, you want to make certain that you choose specifically the ones you think you should target for. Like for instance, if you're if you're writing, I think the thing I, the article I was reading it said if you write like a like a police procedural type of story, make sure you choose police procedural don't just choose mystery because if you put it inside the police procedural you're actually then get it will hit the list of every single campaign and sub campaign it happens to be sitting in and for instance I went and I targeted one of the, my newer books that's actually time travel so I put it in the sci -fi, buried in the sci-fi slash time travel and all of a sudden I see it pop up on sci-fi action adventure and I actually had to go check the categories like I didn't put it in there, but hey, I'm not going to argue with that too. And conversely, is have you guys ever noticed that all of a sudden it'll hit a category that you've never even mentioned a word of before? Because I don't know how the hell it happened, but one of the books one day popped up on a Christian fiction top 10 or top 100. It's like number 65, Christian fiction or Christian romance. That's what it was. I'm looking at it going, <laughs> No, I'm, I'm hitting refresh. I'm clearing out the browser cache just to make sure I'm not pulling some funky data. And, and it kept pulling it back up. I'm like, um, it's not Christian. 
<laughs> I will say that right now. But uh, I mean, it's I would say it's PG-13 rated, but oh my goodness, it's nowhere close to being Christian. And yet some somehow it is. So I'm not sure if the algorithm was just having an off day or what the heck was going on with that. But but yeah, just make sure though of those seven categories, since you're only allowed seven, you know, target them as specific as possible. Don't just pick one something as, as generic as fiction, because just about every other book there, you know, aside from the nonfiction, obviously, is going to be fiction, and you're competing with everyone else. You want to try and target your book as much as possible, where not many other people have targeted, and therefore you can actually you know hit that ranking and start hitting the tiers. It's been a while since I've personally seen Amazon do that, where they actually, it used to be, because I remember about probably like 2012, I think I released my fourth book in my Emperor's Edge series, which was called Conspiracy, and something about the keywords, you know, there was a government plot, blah, 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 got it landed in some political category that had nothing to do with fantasy, it was like nonfiction political memoirs or something, and uh, I haven't seen that for a while, at least with my stuff, that it randomly sticks you in other stuff, but it definitely used to, uh, yeah, sometimes go off your keywords. I had to email KDP or whatever, the dashboard people about that, and because it was like a new release, and I was like, oh, God, I'm just going to find it in this horrible category. Um, one thing I wanted to say here is that most people, when you go into the dashboard, you'll only see that Amazon allows you to select two categories, but then you'll be browsing around and you'll see like a book has seven categories, or I've, I think the most I've heard is like it's in 15 categories or something. Um, sometimes your book only fits in two categories, but like I said with my Dragon Blood stuff, I put it in Steampunk and Epic Fantasy, which you can select from the dashboard, but I also want it in Sword and Sorcery, which as of right now you cannot select from the dashboard as a category. And there's quite a few hidden categories like that. What you do is you have to pick the right keyword when you, <clears throat> when you have the choice to enter your keywords down there. And the keyword for sword and sorcery is sword. And there's there's other categories that you have to get into by keywords, and you have to know the keyword. Um, if I remember it, I can put the link in the show. But if you Google something like uh, it's Amazon keyword browsing categories, I think, as I'm typing it in a check. Yeah, and the first hit that comes up, selecting browse categories, and it, it allows you to kind of see which what you type into that keyword space in order to get into these things. Like in science fiction and fantasy, there's an angels category. I actually haven't seen these, but they're supposedly there. Werewolves and shifters, witches and wizards, uh, Arthurian, maybe you can pick that. Coming of age, that's another one I've used often if it applies that you can't actually select from the dashboard, but it's a good one to be in if you've got a young character, young adult stuff. Uh, sword and sorcery, superhero, alien invasion, you know, and some of these you can get into, but uh, some of them you can just get into with keywords. Uh, and with the keyword thing, you have to be in the overarching category. Like if you want to be in science fiction, alien invasions, you have to have at least one science fiction category selected as those two that you check off in the thing. Um, so that's just something to know. It's a, it's a secret way because some people, sometimes you have a book that can fit in six or eight categories. Obviously, you don't want to put it in where it doesn't make sense, like Jeff's fantasy Christian dragon romance or whatever. <laughs> got to be careful. <laughs> But if it legitimately can fit in multiple categories, yeah, try to get it in as many categories as you can. And um, okay, who brought who brought up category switching to introduce your book to new readers? All right, Jeff, <laughs> go. Yeah, no, that would just be I was I was I've actually experimented with this notion too because I was when I was reading about this a good long while ago, they were saying that if by chance you now you've got your categories set specifically to let's just say epic fantasy and I don't know action adventure. Well, you know, those are you know good categories, but you know, if by chance you know you're looking at your overall sales or your downloads, if it's perma free, then you're noticing that you're, they're just not you know moving as much as you like. Try changing it to, to something else that still pertains to the book, and and you'll actually notice those numbers jump. And I've tried that a few times, and and I don't know, I mean, you know, I don't know if you guys have noticed that that fairly new category called light novel. I and mean, I was looking at that, going, huh, that's you know. I thought maybe that might be like lighthearted sort of thing. What the heck? I'll go ahead and give it a try once. I watched the number of uh, of downloads for the my perma free skyrocket. You know, like jumped up by four or five hundred percent. So I know people are paying attention to those categories. I have not seen the light novel category yet, so <laughs> I'll have to check it out. But 
that's definitely a good tip. I think especially with the permafree, that makes a lot of sense because people will regularly go into the top 100 for like their, this is my genre, this is what I read, you know, I'm not checking out anything else, and they'll look for the new books. Um, I've also heard it suggested, and I think this was David Gogren in his Let's Get Visible book, he talked about this. If you're going to do one of these advertising campaigns like we've talked about, and you're pretty much, you know, nothing's guaranteed, but you're pretty sure you're, maybe you're going to sell like 500 or 1,000 books in a, a short period and maybe get a jump in the rankings, then it can make sense to maybe put your book in a category where it belongs, but maybe you've kind of avoided it because it's so competitive and you couldn't get into the top 100. Uh, like an example in fantasy might be urban fantasy is quite competitive. It seems like the last time I looked, it took like a 2,000 sales ranking just to get it in the top 100. So uh, most of my stuff is, doesn't fit in that anyway, but uh, even if it did, I would avoid it. Like I have a friend that, um, do we have her on the show, Becca, Becca Andre? She writes um, basically urban fantasy, but she always puts her stuff in dark fantasy because it's a lot easier to to rank. So that's something you might do is change your categories too right before a promotion or you know, not only to, to catch new readers because suddenly you'll be have some visibility in a category where before you wouldn't have made it. So that can definitely be a something to try out. All right, I think our last topic, we've been blabbing for an hour here. I've been blabbing mostly. <laughs> you guys just nod. Oh, you're, uh -huh. so, you're so good at it. I don't know how it happens, guys. All right, keywords. Expert. Yeah, that's it. Keywords. Do you want to? Wanted to talk about keywords. That we talked too. about it. <laughs> we sort of we sort of covered keywords a bit. Yeah, I. I but uh, uh, yeah, I, I wrote this one on here. Or is, I was uh, I was looking it up just to see what the how important it was to the overall Amazon algorithm there because I know it. You know, I've heard somewhere that you know you want to if, if you classify your you know, one of your keywords as uh, coming of age. Well, then make certain somewhere in your book description you have it written, coming of age. And then I came across this, you know, that one of the same articles I was reading before that said something specifically that they say, make sure your keywords are mentioned in your book's description. And I even got, I don't know if it's accurate or not, but they, they said, you know, you, you can have a max of 800 characters for your book description. Something about the all-important number is 500. Make sure your character, your description is at least 500 characters long, and if possible, try to get your keywords in there two to five times for every 100 words in your book description. So if it's 500 uh, a word long there, then you should get the thing in there for like, you know, 10 times. Coming of age story this, and this, I mean, it, to me, that I don't know how you'd phrase that in such a way that you don't sound repetitive like crazy, but but apparently that's what they're saying that really works for well for them. So I'm just I gotta see if I can find an example or something that supposedly is the perfect book description, and I'll see if I can maybe model my own after that, see how well it works. But we'll I think see. that could possibly work with nonfiction. This is like you know the SEO stuff where everybody was trained to do back in the day to try to rank highly on Google was to put your keywords in for certain terms that people were looking up. Um, every now and then I'll hear about somebody swearing by something in, in fiction. To be like, yeah, you know, you because you can type in when you're doing your Amazon search. You know how you'll type in like epic fantasy, and then if you keep hit space and like you're gonna keep going, it will suggest some things like epic fantasy adventure novel or something like that. And I have heard a few people on podcasts say, yeah, when I when I added some of those keywords like that, like really specific phrases. Um, yeah, it helped. It really helped. And, and I don't know if I believe this for fiction because I really don't think people type that stuff in that much. And I've actually just, I think uh, it looks at the on-page stuff, like how many people mention steampunk in your reviews for your steampunk book could affect how highly ranked, how quickly you come up when somebody types steampunk or steampunk novel into the search engine. And I've been up there at the top and I've never really noticed that it does anything. So I think maybe possibly this could be one of those things try it if like if you've already gotten into the categories you want to get into I would say make sure you're there first and you have five keywords left over or whatever and you want to try this you know go try it <laughs> like like I was saying you do the Amazon let it suggest some things to you because it's suggesting it based on what other people have searched and then look at the books that come up and if you think well my book could beat that book that book doesn't get any sales and blah blah, blah. it doesn't have the keyword in the description you can try that. Um, I think it may be the kind of thing that maybe will help you go from like one sale a week to two sales a week, but beyond that I'm not sure how effective that would be. I've just not seen that it does anything when you play around with that. And of course you want to be really careful and not 
keyword stuff is, is the SEO thing where your description sounds awkward because you're trying to work these phrases in. Um, I don't know if I'd even bother trying to put them in there. I'd probably just put them in the dashboard if you have some leftover. Um, possibly with nonfiction it could be a little different because I think people do search for nonfiction by typing in like you know how to market on Twitter or some things like that whereas I think with fiction they're browsing in those top 100s they're looking at the also bots they're getting recommendations from friends that kind of thing um, I don't know any final thoughts on this from either of you guys well I'll definitely keep you posted because it's been a good long while since I've spruced, uh, spruced up my book description there so I'm thinking about giving it a try just to see if I can take maybe my two perma-free titles that I have I'll actually revamp the uh, definitely the revamp the descriptions and throw a lot more of the keywords in the description and see if I see a serious uptick of the actual number of downloads so I'll let you guys know All right, Joe has nothing to contribute. <laughs> nothing to contribute. He's my, like nodding. Said, <laughs> blogs not terribly effective. Uh, uh, my blogs are not terribly effective. Although I, I have to say, probably because of the way I write them, most of my keywords are probably in my blurb too, because uh, uh, I, that's their key words. They're key to the novel and the, therefore key to the synopsis that I have written. So uh, I don't know if it's been working or not working because I don't have a control on that. I will say that I'll sometimes put like I'll make the blurb for me is just about selling the book you know it's like trying to make it sound cool but then at the end I'll do something like like the blah blah collection features three full-length novels of action magic and romance because I, I just want to specifically say what's in there and that could be the kind of thing you could add at the end where you're saying like three adventures of epic fantasy <laughs> romance and uh, paranormal rom what you know whatever your things are and Kind of, I think if it comes after the actual exciting things that the characters are doing, that it might be okay. I will say that Libby Hawker does not mention stuffing keywords into the description in her book on Blurb, so I don't know if she's our expert or not. We'll have to get her on the show, even though she writes that historical fiction. You know, it's just, it's almost like fantasy. If you go back far enough in history, it's... You're making stuff up. <laughs> yeah, sure. It's, it's low fantasy. It's there, there. There are probably knights if you go back far enough in history. All right. Well, I think we've talked about everything on our list today. We've talked for over an hour, so hopefully you guys have found something useful. If you have any insight to anything we've talked about and want to tell us we're all wrong or <laughs> disagree or agree, you know, yeah, or, hey, yeah. Lindsay's email is and. <laughs> <laughs> Or you can just leave a comment yeah. on our site until we get our contact form up. Uh, I actually tried to install one, but it was very complicated. So I think I'm just going to go find the same plugin that I have on my other sites and stick that up there. So uh, marketingsff.com is where we are. And if you found us useful or want to leave a review on iTunes or on YouTube, we would also appreciate that. Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast. Uh, thanks a lot for listening, everyone. All right, you guys take it easy. So long. <laughs>